Thank you, Chloe. So um, I was asked by the uh, uh, by Chloe to do a talk for the alumni of Aberdeen University. So um, it's it's a real pleasure to do that. I've been asked to talk for twenty minutes and uh, to talk about my subject, which is rice, which is um, somewhat difficult for me to talk for just twenty minutes because I could talk for hours about it. Um, I, I'm delighted to see some people that I recognise in, in the uh, uh, joining us today. As particularly, I'd like to say hello to Chris Mullins, who um, is in Edinburgh and who uh, is responsible in large part for me being in Aberdeen when I came here 22 years ago or so. So, um, Chloe, I'm ready to start the slides if you can put them up. I don't see the slides. Are they there? Um, one second, it does appear on my screen, so it might just be taking right. a second. There you go. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk to you about rice, water and climate change. Um, it's a subject that's very uh, important to me and uh, it's relevant this week because it is, uh, I believe it's Scottish Climate Week. So here we go. Um, I'm motivated to do research on rice really because I want to help poor people in developing countries so this is a on the right hand side a farmer and his family um, really that's the kind of people I want my research to help so that's a kind of a bit of context in a sort of a more general sense uh, we are encouraged nowadays all large institutions to think about this United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and certainly Aberdeen University is uh, starting to think about its activities in the light of those sustainable development goals. Things that we can do as individuals and institutions that mean that the way we live is sustainable, so we do not re re use resources unsustainably and we leave the planet in a good state for the people who are coming after us. And what I'm going to talk to you about today will be related to development goal one, no poverty, development goal two, zero hunger, and development goal three which is action on climate change so uh, rice is important it's uh, a really important plant I tell my undergraduates it's the second most important uh, species on the planet and the reason I say that is really because it feeds more people than any other plant and so its production is more important to humans than the production of anything else and uh, this book highlights that feature. It is a, a book called The Rice Almanac. It, it has a subtitle called Source Book for the Most Important Economic Activity on Earth. And the reason the book says that is because the authors reckon that more people spend their economic activity growing rice than any other activity. So a, a few facts about rice. We've been growing it for 10,000 years. There are over two, 200,000 different cultivated varieties so it's very very diverse about 750 million tons of it are grown every year and it since it costs about 50p might not be what you would pay in a supermarket but that's roughly the price it's about 300 billion pounds a year is the economic value um, it uses a lot of water about three tons of water to produce a kilo of rice which is equivalent to three times the uk rainfall so to me, that's a huge amount of water uh, is used to grow rice. And for the extreme poor people in, in Asia, for example, they use about one quarter of their daily income to buy rice. So it's very important. Um, rice is not the world's biggest cereal, uh, biggest crop. The world's biggest crop is maize, as this graph shows you. Maize is the world's biggest crop in blue. World production of maize is bigger than rice. But the thing about rice is it's a human food. Most maize grown in the world is given to animals. Almost all rice is given to humans. So this is why I say it's the most important plant on the planet. Where is rice grown? Um, this map shows you roughly where rice is grown. One thing is really obvious, it's not grown in Scotland. Um, the closest we're going to get to it is probably Italy. Um, because rice is a, essentially a tropical crop will grow in temperate regions if the summer is hot enough. It likes hot weather. 
But I really like to show this slide, and especially useful for a talk on, to alumni, because um, we can grow rice all through the year as long as we heat our greenhouse to 25 degrees. Uh, but I tell people it's the most we have the most uh, northerly rice field in the world, and I want to give you some flavour of some of the things that we we do with that facility to grow rice in Aberdeen. So uh, another little bit of background. Um, this graph shows you the trend in rice yields. This is tons of rice produced per hectare since 1960, and what you can see for different countries is it's going up in a positive direction and that's really important because it's so important for food security that we keep on producing enough rice and as the population grows demand grows but we get better at doing it so that the yield per hectare goes up um, and Egypt is really interesting because um, Egypt at the top one has reached what we call the yield potential what we think is you can't really get more than about 10 tons per hectare from a rice field and the reason Egypt is so good at it is because they have all the water they want, they have all the sun they want, because they're growing it in a desert with irrigation from the Nile. Um, so um, really what we want to do is get all of these other countries up to the level of Egypt in an ideal sense, and then we would have really high levels of food security. I'm going to mention Bangladesh a few times because some of the work we're doing is in Bangladesh. Okay, so. The thing about rice is it uses a lot of water. So these photographs show pictures of uh, rice underwater. Um, and uh, that water, a lot of that is irrigated. Mostly it's irrigated. So 75% of all the water used for humans is, is used to irrigate crops. And nearly half of that is used to irrigate rice. This graph shows you, this map of the world shows you regions of the world which are what we call uh, suffering from water. Uh, insecurity so there's a high water insecurity risk um, and I'm going to highlight here Bangladesh here what this is saying is projecting into the future Bangladesh is not likely to have enough water to meet its current demands unless something is done about it um, and uh, many parts of the world uh, water used for rice production is unsustainable this is an electric uh, pump that's used to irrigate rice, uh, uses electricity, uses fossil fuels to generate electricity. The water that is used is not replaced, so it's uh, unsustainable. Uh, rice contributes itself to greenhouse gas emissions and therefore climate change. Uh, like all agriculture, Agriculture accounts, as I'll say in a minute, for about 10% of the greenhouse gas emissions of human activity. But rice is special because rice produces more than other cereals. So this graph, you can't probably see it in any great detail. This is a sort of, a, it's called the carbon forcing, but essentially this is the amount of greenhouse gases that come off from rice production or wheat or corn. And they over already got um, pork, beef, mutton. It, this is specifically for China. And whilst it's obvious that rice is a lot less than meat production, uh, rice is a lot higher than wheat or corn. And I'll show you another graph exactly the same. This is that one's China. This one is for the for the globe global greenhouse gas production. Essentially, you can see it. You can't see that possibly. This is cereals, and this is rice. Rice is tends to be three times greater than other cereals like the wheat that we grow in the UK for example and the reason for it is the reason that rice is higher than anything else is two reasons really highlighted here this is a this is a beautiful figure I use in a lot of my talks which just shows you some of the in a nice graphical way the contributors of uh, different parts of agriculture to greenhouse gases so I said agriculture is about 10 percent of human caused global warming Rice is special because this one here, this is uh, methane from rice production, and this is the greenhouse gases associated with irrigation. Um, methane is really important because if, you've, if you're familiar with the concept of uh, marsh gas, any area of land which has a high carbon content in the soil 
that carbon will be converted into methane through bacterial activity. And that's exactly what happens in a rice field. Because it's flooded, it's anaerobic. Bacteria convert carbon in the soil to methane. And you get this unique thing for rice, which is methane production. Um, rice also has these in. This is nitrous oxide that is produced from agricultural fields. And this is the um, greenhouse gases that are used in the production of fertilizer. This is attributable to all crops. But rice is especially bad, really, because of these. So what, I, what we're doing is quite a lot of work on something called alternate wetting and drying. And that is a technique which, instead of having the field always flooded, as in the bottom left picture here, uh, the farmer can have it dry for a period. So the, the farmer takes these pipes. I don't, know, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but if you can't, this lady is holding a pipe. The farmer puts that pipe into the field, into the soil, and then he will look down that, stop watering. The water will come off the field. And when he can't see the water in the pipe anymore, he can flood again. And that goes through an, a, a, an alta, alternating cycle of wet and dry. And it's being very heavily promoted in places like Bangladesh. On the right hand side, there's a leaflet in Bengali uh, telling farmers about alternate wetting and drying as a way to save water. That's the, really the motivation for doing it. But it's going to do more than just save water. It's going to be good for the planet. This is a project we've been involved with in uh, Vercelli in Italy uh, through the European Union. Uh, and this is a field with 12 different rice varieties plotted out with alternate wetting and drying and continuously flooding. And we've been measuring greenhouse gases. When I say we, I mean Vicky Oliver working for Aberdeen University has been measuring greenhouse gases uh, using these chambers. So these chambers sit on the crop and you can measure the amount of greenhouse gases that come off and the nice thing about it on this graph here is that alternate wetting and drying reduces greenhouse gases by about threefold at least two to threefold and that's uh, it's not just us that find this this is uh, almost universal people find that alternate wetting and drying reduces methane production it's mostly because of the impact on methane so it's great alternate wetting and drying is a really nice technique for reducing the the Environmental footprint of rice. We've been doing similar work in Bangladesh where we've been growing 300 rice varieties uh, in Bangladesh Agricultural University. And I'm just going to show you one slide of that, just about yield. What we have here is a graph of the yield that we got in continuously flooded rice versus the yield in alternate wetting and drying rice. Um, because all of these dots, these are 300 different rice varieties, because all of these dots are above this one-to-one -one line, or nearly all of them, most of these cultivars have a higher yield in alternate wetting and drying than they do it in normal conditions. It's an amazing result, uh, on average 33% in this experiment. We don't find that in every experiment, and not everybody finds this, but in general, AWD does not decrease yield, and sometimes it increases it, um, and we don't even know why. It does. Okay, so alternate wetting and drying is a quite a nice idea, and I'll come back to it. Uh, but um, that is a, essentially a technique that can tackle the, the fact that rice contributes to greenhouse gases. I want to flip everything and talk about the impact of green, uh, of climate change on rice, because um, and, unless uh, unless you're in a strange political world of climate change denial, you, uh, you appreciate that the planet is warming. And that will have consequences on all of our crops, and not no least on rice. So some really nice research done a few years ago now from uh, the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines on the effect of temperature, higher temperature on rice. They revealed the 10% reduction in rice yield for every one degree increase in the minimum night temperature. Um, so not the day temperature that's so important, it's the temperature at night. If the temperature at night goes up over a threshold, um, the yields will go down. It's, it's complex physiology that explains it. But they also reckon that in their study, they already noticed a 1.1 degree increase in temperature. And for me, that is really scary stuff. And that's why I'm also an environmental and, and climate change campaigner, because I think the consequences of climate change on agriculture is uh, potentially really scary. Um, 
and I think maybe that's one of the reasons why, if you look at this graph, come back to this graph, Egypt has this fantastic uh, growth in yield, and but you can see now it's going down, and I do wonder whether or not that is actually because of climate change. I don't know the answer, but um, it is a possibility that um, yield potentials are, are a challenge for Egypt because it's getting too hot. Um, we're doing something that uh, will help use this alternate wetting and drying, which is to look at um, a, a, a pathogen, a plant pathogen called the root knot nematode, um, work by uh, Roshi Shrestha, where um, this little nematode, tiny little worm, makes grows on the roots of plants and uh, causes these galls, these these swellings called galls, and the worrying thing about these nematodes is um, they are they're a tropical pest but they have moved into Italy so this is a photo of uh, this pest impacting crops in Italy uh, they've moved in we think because of climate change climate change allows pests that are tropical to move into temperate regions it's a prediction that you can see happening but we're doing some work on this um, so the thing about this nematode um, nematodes in general account for something like 20 to 30 percent of yield loss in rice um, and this nematode this one root knot nematode is the most important the the root living nematode cannot live in anaerobic soils it lives in a root if it's if the field is flooded it cannot move from plant to plant but they can come out and cause a new infection if the soil becomes aerobic if there's no longer flooded it, maybe the nematode can spread and we're really worried that we have to think about that when we're promoting alternate wetting and drying will alternate wetting and drying allow this nematode to become even worse so here's a nice little experiment it's a it's a really elegant and so simple experiment where we take two rice plants and put them into a pot but one of these pots has been inoculated with this, this nematode. We say it's been pre-infected. Pre and we grow it next to one that's not been infected. And we grow them for, uh, I think it was five weeks, and then we pull them out and we measure how many nematodes or galls we can see on the infected plant and on the adjacent plant. And that's under continuous flooding, CF, alternate wetting and drying and aerobic. And you can see very clearly that under aerobic conditions, the nematode spreads spreads within the infected plant and spreads to the non-infected plant whereas it doesn't do that in the flooded system but really worrying is in the alternate wetting and drying it's almost as bad as the aerobic so we we could be really quite worried about this but luckily we found some cultivars that are resistant so we've screened uh when i say we i'll show you a picture of stanley in a second who has screened uh, 300 rice varieties from around the world this is Stanley. This is his experiment. Um, he's a huge experiment testing uh, nematode resistance in, in a very large number of cultivars. A really, really exciting result that he found. When he tested uh, 300 cultivars, he found two called the uh, cowpox male and this one called LD24, a totally resistant. We had to repeat this experiment. So you've got here on this plot two experiments. This is the number of goals in a big screen of 300 cultivars and a repeated experiment where we tested in bigger pots for a longer time to confirm that these two are completely resistant and it's not reported in the literature that anyone's found resistance in this in Ariza sativa asian rice so we're very excited they've been checked out in the philippines as well and they are resistant in the field in the philippines and in india they're resistant um, we've used um, modern sequencing techniques to, uh, uh, in collaboration with the University of Ghent to map that resistance to uh, um, one small part of the rice chromosome, 11. Rice has got 12 chromosomes. We found it on chromosome 11 in both of them, and that is now being used for breeding. There's groups in Italy, in, uh, in um, two groups in Italy actually and one in, in India who are now using that information to breed resistance into their nematodes. So th this is almost the last slide. Um, I've been telling you about climate change, that uh, rice is a, 
rice is a contributor to climate change. All agriculture is a contributor to climate change. This is, we, we heard about it on the news, I think it was yesterday or, or the day before, a statement from Greenpeace, a, a report from Greenpeace. Most countries are getting nowhere in addressing the contribution of agriculture to greenhouse gas emissions. But rice is special because of this flooded nature. It produces methane and uh, irrigation water. Uh, so alternate wetting and dry drying looks awesome because it uses less water, it uses less power to irrigate, it reduces methane emissions. It also reduces arsenic. It's not something I've been telling you, I've told you about before uh, at all, but we've done a lot of work on the accumulation of arsenic into rice grain and al alternate wetting and drying will reduce that as well. So it looks absolutely superb as a technique for addressing some critical issues. Um, if people are going to go to alternate wetting and drying, they're going to have to address this nematode. Um, uh, but that could be okay because we seem to have found a really good source of resistance, which uh, which nobody had reported before. So that's really rather exciting. And I'll, I'll, I'll finish with my last point, which is it looks really, really great, but will farmers do it? It's a, it's a really important point about being a scientist, which is what I am. We can do all the science we want, we all the experiments we want and find exciting results. But getting that translated into the field is another thing. And there are what we would recognize from, from some of the research we've done, some serious, what we call socioeconomic barriers to farmers using alternate wetting and drying. And that's something we want to do through um, interdisciplinary work. Uh, going forward. So I finished with this slide. This is a this is a slide taken a few the last time I was in Bangladesh actually when going around a uh, farmers fields you always get a congregation of kids wondering why there's some uh, uh, essentially why there's some white people are standing in their fields um, but these are the rice farmers of the future and um, I'm hoping we can uh, uh, make their rice production more sustainable. So thank you very much. I will take questions. Great. Thanks so much for um, presenting on that, Adam. I definitely feel like I learned something because I don't have a lot of knowledge in that area, so it was really interesting to listen to. And I can see that we do have some questions already. So one from Keith says, how does AWF technique compare with SRI method systems of rice intensification. Does IRRI accept AWF? A AWD, alternate wetting and drying, is a technique. It's actually probably a really old technique. At least 100 years ago, people were trying to use uh, alternate wetting and drying as a way to reduce mosquitoes. Um, and then it fell out of favor. But uh, the international rice research now are heavily promoting alternate wetting and drying. The, the, the story of uh, SRI, System of Rice Intensification, which is a water saving technique, is um, it's a very interesting one, which has a lot of promise. And I don't think, uh, 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 there was a time when it was a, a bit dismissed as a sort of wacky, wacky science, but it's not dismissed anymore. Um, and I could talk for a long time about it. But there are, there are some extraordinary claims being made about System of Rice Intensification. Um, it requires quite substantial changes in farmer behavior to operate it, so there are big socioeconomic barriers to its use, but it has a huge role. So they're both, they're both good techniques and they're both being promoted, but there are socioeconomic barriers to both. Great, thank you. And we have one from Grace that says, thank you, Adam, for the fantastic sharing. Is it affordable for the local farmers to install equipment to do wetting and drying? It's a very interesting question because we've done these experiments in Bangladesh where the idea is just to get a, a, a pipe to put in the field. In fact, you could actually use a two litre Coke bottle and make holes in it. So the the equipment is actually not a, not a problem. But when we don't know in Italy, the concept would be not using a pipe, but using um, an electronic device that measures soil water. Well, that's the way an Italian farmer might use it. Um, but even that is not very expensive. Um, but for, for a Bangladeshi farmer, it's not the equipment. The challenge is really 
for a, for a Bangladeshi farmer where they get the water from and how they pay for that water because at the moment for most farmers they're not incentivized to use less water they pay for the amount of area they they flood not the amount of water they use um, so there's no financial incentive to use less thank you um are there any other oh and grace has just said yes especially the paddy rice fields are facing drought mm. um, the farmer could be you. quite scared about doing it if uh, they're not in control of the water supply and are there any other questions from anyone i'll give it a minute or two Um, okay, well, if we don't have any other questions, I guess we can kind of end it there. If just, I'm just like waiting to see just in case someone does have another question. Um, but if not, okay. Um, thanks very much, Adam. For, thanks to everyone for attending. Yes, and thank you, so, thank you to everyone also for attending. We have um, recorded the session, so we can also share that afterwards. Um, but yes, thanks to everyone, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.